Hi, I'm Chuck Braverman. This is another episode of West Doc. We have an amazing historical documentary years today on the hundred years of Warner Brothers Studios. And I'm going to introduce you to the guest in just a moment. But first, I want to remind you that we're brought to you in part by Real Screen. Um, if you go to the bottom of our website at weststockonline.com, there's an icon for Real Screen there. Click on it. It'll tell you about the events that are coming up in their world. Today, we have Leslie Iwerks, who is an experienced documentary filmmaker, let's say. Hello. Good morning, Leslie. How are you? Good morning. How are you doing? Good. I always ask my guests, where are they physically in the country? Are you, I suspect, in L.A. area, Southern California, somewhere or somewhere else? I'm, yeah, I'm actually up in Ojai, California. In Ojai. How nice. Yeah. A lovely area. Um, so you've made this incredible film, which just sounds like it would be an amazing uh, weight on your shoulders called 100 Years of Warner Brothers, except for the fact that when I looked at your your list of the films that you've made, it, it probably wasn't all that daunting because you've done this before um, for in several other historical films. Um, and I could tell everybody a little bit about our background, but let me just start by saying we do have a couple things in common. Number one, we're both members of the International Documentary Association. Number two, we're both members of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. And number three, we both graduated from the best film school in the world, University of Southern California. Uh, but I'd love to hear a little bit about your, your background. I, I know about your, your family history, and I, I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about your family and how much of an influence that had on you getting into the business or not to start out. Sure. Um, so I grew up in Burbank, um, and I my grandfather uh, and father both worked at Disney for many years. Uh, my grandfather was a co-creator and designer of Mickey Mouse, and my dad was um, many, 35 years at the studio, both Oscar-winning uh, pioneers in animation and visual effects and camera systems technology. So grew up around that and um, kind of many trips to the back lot of Disney and behind the scenes at the Disney theme parks, sort of uh, seeing how things got, got done and got made. And uh, it was really a fun way to grow up. And um, but in addition to that, also grew up on the other side where I'm seeing Warner Brothers Water Tower and the Warner Brothers Studio. Um, not far from Disney. So, you know, just around the around the industry growing up. Um, so to tell the story of Warner Brothers this many years later and really get a deep dive into what was going on behind those walls um, as I was growing up and all the way through today was really a fun dive into history, you know, because I knew so much about Disney having told stories about Disney. So... It was fun to be able to interview all these. Having gone to USC, I was saying that, you know, I was in Leonard Malton's film class. I was telling somebody in, in film history class. And now, you know, I get to interview all these people directly about their history, you know, from Oliver Stone to, you know, Kevin Costner to, you know, everybody that was in that film. Um, it was fun to be able to talk straight to them about their own their own stories rather than have to learn about it through history books. Uh, okay, let's take a look at the trailer. The thing about Warner Brothers, they were there at the very beginning, they were not only creating an art form, but also an industry. And you had to be tough. You say the name and you understand it's one of the powerhouses of Hollywood that gave us the cinema. When you look back at the last hundred years, it's an incredible American story. The uh, stuff that dreams are made of. Warner Brothers to me was action Hollywood. Very daring artistic achievements. That's what I think about when I think of Warner. They were dirt poor, but they gambled everything. You were tough street guys clawing to success. They're big gangsterish in their DNA, the brothers. 
What can you say about that transaction that sends your older brother to an early grade? Sam Warner really believed this sound technology could revolutionize cinema. You ain't heard nothing yet. The factory system was breaking down. It has been described as one of the worst business deals in the history of business. We all looked to Warner Brothers for films that had a special quality to them and took chances. They were very brave at times that were not easy to be very brave. They were always a studio that took risks. And they were that now if you're going to go up to the bell, ring it. Hey, boys, look what I got here. Hey, where are the white women at? And I've been ringing that bell ever since. <laughs> You know, we don't know if it'll work. Let's just try it. You have to invest in stories that make people uncomfortable and have never been told before. People being able to see their own stories. It is the greatest sense of validation. Oh, hey! This was the greatest place in the world. Respect must be paid. Go ahead, make my day. I'd never seen films like that before. Everything working together for the vision of a filmmaker. I think what's made Warner Brothers last 100 years is that inclination to swing for the fences and trust filmmakers. Telling great stories that have a real impact is where the Warner Brothers made a difference because stories are powerful. By having this famous family history and name, were you intimidated at all by the idea of going into the business? I mean, did you ever think, well, I'm just going to do something completely different, or was it almost a given because you were right there in Burbank and your dad and your grandfather were, you know, so well known? Did you just think, well, that's where I'm going, or how did that happen? You know, it's interesting. Not really. I, um, I always felt I think growing up an interest in film. Um, and I was interested in the technology side of it. I was interested in the filmmaking creative side of it. And definitely at some point said, I want to go to film school. Um, but I never took it for granted that, you know, I could actually be good at it. <laughs> you know, I mean, you got to prove yourself no matter who you are. And so it, the first film I did, um, was actually on my grandfather. It was a story I told called The Hand Behind the Mouse, the Bywork story. And it was a that was purely something that I had to do for me because my grandfather died when I was one. And I had no expectations of this except that I wanted to make the best film I could. And I got Roy Disney to support it. And they produced it and they put it up for an Academy Award and gave it even more money to to make it longer. And so that was my first like hint at, hey, you know, I'm getting really good feedback from the studio saying this is, you know, you're you're you know how to make a documentary really well. Um, and that just led to one thing after the next. And so it's been a series of, you know, opportunities to travel, do ethnographic films, environmental films, social impact films, but also these bigger uh, stories of, of of big brands and big studios and, and biographies and things like that, which has been a lot of fun to balance that. So um, the background also, of my family didn't really matter. Right. I mean, it was nice, but it's not like I went into animation, you know what I mean? Or <laughs> something right. that they already did. They were in a whole different realm. I went into a different realm of film. So that it didn't really matter, you know. I'm looking at some of your credits, which are very eclectic and very amazing, as you say, beside animation. I mean, one of the things that jumps out at me um, is the is the fake news by Am uh, Macedonian teenagers. How did you get on to that story and what what's behind that film? So, you know what, that film was something that uh, so it's a passion project. So basically, I'll do these bigger projects that are, you know, Disney or Pixar or, you know, Warner Brothers or the ones that will be the bigger paying projects, multi-million dollar docs. And then these other ones are little ones that I will do on my own. I will fund them myself. And so I'm always looking for what are what can I go and do in between the bigger shows that I can just fund myself, go travel, really low budget, like thirty, fifty thousand dollar stuff, right? I mean that's not necessarily low, but it's it's not you know, to the level of the other ones, right? So I can say, okay, let me go do this and let me shoot it myself or let me bring on a DP and let me just 
be go back to my scrappy days of film school and you know get one person to light it and we just go and do it and so when I was during the 2016 election, you know, the, the, obviously, you know, it was a very tumultuous time as it is now. And the whole idea of fake news was becoming very present and the and the impact of it was having major effects. And reading about this article in Wired magazine about these teenagers who were, you know, coming up with ways to sort of impact Facebook and and create all these fake news and disseminate them um, around the world and hire hire American writers. Um, that was shocking to me. And so anyway, was able to go and get a local line producer to help arrange interviews with these people and really get to the main guy and, and tell the story of that. And um, it was it was a seed of things that that I want to continue to do, you know, to talking about this impact of misinformation. And where is that film around and available now? Where could somebody see that? Because it's still, it's, it's as, as contemporary and important to, even more so maybe today. Right. Right. I mean, I, I think it's on our website. I think it's, it's not really, it was a short film, so it didn't, it got um, limited distribution. And then now, I mean, it's kind of, <laughs> not really out there, but I, I think it, you can find it on the web. Sully lies. I, I was I I watched the entire series, you know, uh, of your Warner Brothers show, and it was just, it was amazing how. First of all, of course, you had the A plus uh, filmmakers and superstar names that you you interviewed. Uh, and the films, it just they just keep coming and coming with these famous, great films. Were you intimidated at all by the idea of kind of telling the story, the history of of Warner Brothers, which is so important? And, uh, you know, so much of it we, we've we experienced in the individual films, and here you're putting it down into four hours. Of, you know, how did you approach that, and how did you organize that from the beginning? So it was it was not easy. Um, I think this was the the hardest project from a scope standpoint that I've ever done. I think a lot of people on my team pretty much said the same thing. It was like we were tackling this huge epic thing with all these movies and how do you shape it? And first it started out as an eight part series and it went to six and five, four, three, two, one. And then it went back to three and then finally to four. Um, we had about a month and a half to get our fourth episode literally built from scratch. I mean, not from scratch, but basically built um, this, that, this last year. Um, so it was a race. It was not only a very big scope, but the schedule was really, really tight. We basically did four. We, our first interview was June 1st last year, our first interview. And we were on the air with all four episodes, June 1st, a year later. So if that doesn't tell you the, the, the insanity that we were under of schedule, four hours and less than a year basically to finish, um, it took a lot of um, just staying in alignment with our team, with our producers, and who, who were diehard to get this right. Um, you know, from the beginning, I worked with Warner Brothers to, to figure out who were the the what were the main films we really wanted to focus on? They gave me a lot of leeway. I worked with um, a, what I call my brain trust, which was George Feltenstein from Warner Brothers, head of archives. I got Leonard Malton to to, to be a part of that. Um, Jeff Briggs from Warner Brothers. These guys know the history so well. And we would have these Zooms like once or twice a day during the development phase. Um, sorry, once or twice a week. And and just talk through the history and start marking what are the impact films that really you cannot miss. And I would just ask question after question. What what are the scenes? What are the famous actors? Like who's important to include and who's not? Obviously there was so much more that had to sift sift away and to let to see what would actually stay in the film. But it was a t it was sort of a push pull between what we wanted and what we set out to do. And then we figure out okay, here are the interviewees that we really want, and who's going to give us the most bang for our buck, right? Um, not only to speak about one film, but can also speak to the history of the whole studio. So you didn't always know if, say, Linda Lavin would know about you know a lot of other things beyond her own show of Alice. But same with like um, 
George Clooney. He knew a lot about Warner Brothers history, so it was a gift. So I can include him. Scorsese, we knew, knew a lot about the history. So we really wanted to make sure he was a part of this. Um, so it was it was really just trying to align our interviews. Then it was the schedule of the interviews. And we were already sort of trying to edit, but the, the schedule got pushed late, pushed later. Um, so we were really sort of kind of backing into what did we get from our interviews and what could rise to the surface. And that helped to inform what the stories were as well. There were things that we weren't, we didn't know, you know, about say William Friedkin's story about Exorcist or George Clooney's story about his own career with Warner Brothers. There were lots of surprises along the way that ultimately changed our narrative um, compared to what we thought it was going to be at the beginning. So it was just a lot of navigating a lot of history and a lot of time frames and a lot and narratively structurally how do you how do you tell the story of the films and then go back to tv and go back in time and make it clear you know so so the narrative structure the chronology was also a challenge to try to make make it very clear and concise to the viewer so it's in four one-hour episodes did you how many editors did you have and were they did, I mean, the, now that you tell me that it was eight and then six and three and one, I'm. how did you decide who was going to... You must have had multiple things going on at the same time in different editing se sessions. Well, so we when we were greenlit, it was it finally got greenlit to a three-hour, right? Three-hour episodes, three one-hour episodes for, the, for a budget. But then um, as we got into it, so many of our interviews were so strong for episode two. We had so much content for episode two and it was some of the richest material, but to leave all that on the cutting room floor to get it down to an hour, our argument to the studio was, would you consider going to four, going back to four and putting up a bit more money? And I think everybody, including David Zaslav said, it's a no brainer, let's just do it. And, you know, and, and we had people at the studio that we were working with that are like, God, this needs to be longer. It needs to be longer. It needs to be longer. So. You know, it was tough. It was this push-pull and this deadline that was not movable um, and to figure out, you know, do you cut who you just shot? <laughs> you know what I mean? All these great stories. So thankfully, uh, everybody got it, supportive of that concept when we went to four. Um, you know, would I have loved it to have been six or eight? Of course, everybody would have loved that. But, you know, I think we told a tight, tight a story as we could to keep it moving through through all the different decades, you know? You know, th thinking about what you're saying, it, it, it could have easily been 10, right? Yeah, I mean, for that, sure. Quite, and, and I think there's no reason in the world why you couldn't go back to them in a year and say, hey, why don't we expand this into a, into 10 hours? I mean, I would I would sit there certainly and watch. Um, yeah. Who did you try and get for an interview that you didn't get or wasn't available? Or is there anybody on the list that you want to talk, say that you would like to have had? For interviews, um, I'm trying to think. Not really. I mean, oh, I. You know what? We tried to get Warren Beatty, so <laughs> I wanted to get Warren Beatty for uh, Bonnie and Clyde, and and he said, "Well, let's have lunch, and we'll talk about it." So we had a lunch, and it turned into <laughs> six hour lunch at the Beverly Hills Hotel. And I thought, okay, six hours, I'm going to get him. He's going to be in this film, but he, he ended up not being in it. And he just felt like he, I don't know. I don't know what his reasoning was. I think he just felt like he wanted more of a story about his life story than be a part of a bigger bigger story. And um, and he talked to me about that. And I, I just said, well, it's up to you at the end of the day. But so we... He would. He was the one person that knew that that actually could have spoken about Jack Warner, because he had met with Jack Warner in his office. They had that famous story about the water tower and the initials in the water tower. I wanted all that in there, but you know we couldn't. So we used we used Bonnie and Clyde as just kind of a fast transition point, and and that was it. We didn't land in it, and and that was you know that was part of our process as is where do you land in a film? Where do you land in a moment in history and really focus on that versus montage it out and get through it and then get to the next point, right? Um, and so it's it was a lot to sort of figure out. I was thinking at the end of the fourth episode, I started taking notes, which I, I like, you know, pages of notes from episode three and four. And I wish I had sitting taking notes in one and two. I have to go back and look at some of it. But what I got from the show, which was 
I hope I'm I'm right, and I'd love to hear your take on top of what I say. That Warner Brothers seems to be very unique in that they would take a risk on a lot of projects that other places wouldn't. Risk, risk, risk. I put down here, which, and to their to their credit, you know, these risks paid off not only financially and with successful movies, but you know, important films that might not have been made. And the other things that I got out of your show, again, I want to hear what your take is, that the the reason they had such great talent there a lot of the times is because it was known for treating talent well and taking care of people and that they were kind of more of a family than just a report to work place. Right. No, you're absolutely right, Chuck. I think that um, the thing about Warner Brothers that I didn't realize was was just how family oriented it was and how much they really um, trusted filmmakers to go out and be bold. And also when you look at like um, John Kelly's relationship with Stanley Kubrick, you know, he they were friends, but he also just gave him so much leeway, so much of a long leash, so to speak, to go, you know what, just go do your film and it could go on for years, <laughs> you know, and it was fun to get the inside perspective from the studio about Kubrick. You don't hear that side very often, you know. And so we really went back and looked at archival interviews of Kelly and Ross and everybody and just really tried to bring that layer to the story um, because we've seen docs on Kubrick and his point of view and stuff like that. Um, and I was always just trying to weave the business, the leadership story, um, the economics, what was going on in the world to the creative vision of the filmmaker and why they were making this movie. What was the import of it? Um, what was the impact? And it wasn't just make a movie just to be always be entertaining. It was about make a movie to make a difference. And those are the kinds of films that I really wanted to to focus on and why the studio would green like that. Like, you know, from Exorcist to Deliverance, you know, Alice Doesn't Live Here. All those films in the 70s were so out there and they were pushing the envelope at, the, at a time when audiences hadn't seen these kinds of things before. So those are the those are the sort of the things that interested me, you know. So now, obviously, you were working in cooperation with the studio, but what kind of clearance problems, even with that cooperation, did you did you have? Clearance um, we, and, well, and and union issues, if any. I'm we, um, I mean, it was challenging. Um, this was, you know, a four specials that were in sense promoting 100 years of Warner Brothers. And um, we we basically have Adele Sparks, who is our clearance producer, who was a rock star, like our rock on getting everything, getting the legal team prepped. You know, everybody has to be in alignment. This is a fast schedule. Get it, you know, everybody just, you cannot sit and wait on a contract. You have to get it and turn it around. Get it and turn it around. And so we had to go out to a lot of the actors, you know, um, to get to get their rights, um, you know, to use this footage. But in that, again, posed a problem because our schedule was so tight. We we're getting it to the very end and we're like, will you approve it? And had they said no, uh, we would have had to re-edit and we were running out of time. So all that was stressful. But fortunately, if they had any notes at all, it was super minor and we were able to do it. So. Well, I don't quite understand that. Are you talking about films that were made under the Warner Brothers brand that they did not control the rights to where you had to get permissions? Or you, you couldn't go to all the living actors in all the films and ask for permission to, to use a clip on a, in a documentary? No. no, we didn't need to do that. But it was relationships like George, like um, Chris Nolan and you know, um, a lot of these relationships that the studio has with actors, it's a courtesy to say, hey, here's the section we're editing. Are you good with it? Do you have any notes, thoughts, anything you object to? You know, it's a courtesy thing. And um, and as I said, I, I respect that about Warner Brothers. They don't want to, you know, talk, have a doc that talks about certain actors that could, you know, they want to make sure everyone's happy with it. Is it a fair question to ask? Did you did you lose any clips that you really wanted because of this? No, not part? really. Not not that I can think of. Um, there was nothing that was like, oh, we're gonna 
create some sort of crazy controversy that somebody's going to be upset about. You know what I mean? It was, this was more about um, the truth of the hardship of making some of these films and some of the reactions of some of these films. And it's really more of a factual look at the impact of the movies themselves. So it was, it, that was just time consuming and a lot, but we, it wasn't hard as far as to having to change anything or, you know, the reactions. Did you ever think that you were walking on a tightrope in terms of it not looking, you didn't want it, I assume, to look like an infomercial for Warner Brothers. And right. I think that because it was very positive and uh, about Warner Brothers and the executives, um, how did you feel about that issue? Was that an issue for you? I mean, it's going to be the, in the eye of the beholder, but... I don't ever look at any of these and walk into it going, I want to go make an infomercial for this company. Like we're looking at it as a factual story. And this, we criticized Jack Warner quite often in this episode one. We, <laughs> he's not a uh, yeah. necessarily a positive figure. I mean, you know, even throughout the whole show, people are really honest about their failings and about where they misjudged. Um, we we go into the major mistakes that were made at Warner Brothers, and there was never any pushback from Warner Brothers at all saying, oh, don't talk about this or don't talk about that. Um, it was really up to me to choose what, what uh, near-death experiences, what horrible mistakes, what lack of vision or judgment did they have um, that we want to talk about, right? And also you balance that with what were some of the things that were incredibly unique and visionary that they did that actually made it really successful. So with any studio that's a hundred years old, you're going to have your ups and downs, your near death experiences, your, you know, near crash collisions, you know, um, and we really work to focus on what are the conflicts that we're going to point out for early on and go into those. And, and I appreciated that the executives that we interviewed were really honest about, about everything. Um, Nobody wanted this to be a puff piece. It was meant to be a true, honest look, warts and all, of the studio. And that's what makes it a better film. So I was fortunate to work with the studio that was is on, wanting to be as honest about itself. So when you started this film over a year ago, um, Warner Brothers and Discovery... Had they just, I can't remember what the timing was, when, when was the merger in relation to the making of this film? So the merger happened, uh, we started it in development with Anne Sarnoff, and then um, I think there was maybe six months or so, and then she, then the transition happened, and, eight, and then um, Discovery came in and bought it. And we just continued along our, our path. We just continued. No one was ever like, hey, you're, this is all going to be on the chopping block. We finally had our meeting with David Zaslav, and um, we were already thick into developing the treatment and the the episode breakdown, the budget, all that stuff. And he, he just said, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't want to tell the story. It's a great story. And he knew a lot about the history of Warner Brothers um, and – knew i mean was a big fan of so many of the films so it was nice for me to to meet both ceos but to see how much the films meant to him and the history meant to him to say let's do it we need to celebrate the studio you know or not necessarily celebrate but tell the story of the studio This may be an unfair question, and you don't have to answer it if you don't want to, but I'm still trying to wrap my head around the idea that they combined all those well-known brands, HBO, Discovery, Warner Brothers, and there's a dozen I'm not even mentioning, into this one streaming service called Max. Does that, again, I'm prefacing it by saying, don't answer this and I'll cut it out if you don't want to answer it, but I don't understand that, you know, uh, because they're all wonderful, great brands, and now you've sort of smushed them all together into one channel, one place. I yes. mean, you know, that's a good Zaslav question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it seems to me that the uh, consolidation of streaming service is probably going to be, con you know, continuing. I mean, to to do it, to me, I don't know. I don't know enough about the business model of the streaming networks, but... 
you got all those under one roof and people go to one spot and can see everything in one spot That's the versus only reason having I could, the three only or four I, different. I could think of. But if they're so different, HBO is so different than Discovery, which is so different than the Warner Brothers. And But I think that's the only thing I could think of. And I thought maybe I was missing something. Well, but, you know, you look at Disney, it's got Nat Geo, it's got Marvel, it's got... So imagine if those were all their own streaming networks, you know? It's like you've got all these brands with all these different this content. If you know you're going to one place to watch an HBO show versus, you know, you want to watch a Looney Tunes. Like, to me, it just seems like the economics would make more sense but um but you just have to know that that that's what you're going for it's all there in one spot you know but it's all you know it's all at a higher level than me me too T tell me what you're working on now for the future so we have a new uh series coming out with warner brothers um it's going to be announced um, soon. It's already been announced, but the air date has not, or the title, but it's a new docuseries on the history of DC Comics and the whole evolution of DC um, through multi, all the different media. And it's similar in a way to the Warner Brothers, where it's the business story, it's the artistic story, it's the artists, it's the films, it's the it's the characters, all all interwoven across three hours. Um, and so you'll be hearing a lot about that um, in the coming week or so. And so I'm really excited to unveil that. We've been working hard on both of these shows for for the last year and a half. And do you where, where are your editing facilities? Are you out? Are they in Burbank somewhere, or where are you spread out? Are you? We have been can, uh, we have been working on uh, over Zoom remotely, and so the entire both shows were entirely filmed remote uh, edited remotely, and we filmed in D we filmed in um, uh, New York and L A, and for both shows and and everybody's been working over Zoom so. It's a whole new world, you know. It took a while to for me to get used to edit, uh, to be giving notes over Zoom, to be meeting over Zoom every single day. Um, it definitely had its challenges. Um, I'm not sure I'm totally in, into it, to be honest with you. I miss the in-person opportunity to sit across from somebody or next to somebody and just talk through an idea and to laugh and have a good time. It's just so much more stilted on Zoom. But we're working. We're working on on the next way to to do the the next series so so yeah so i'm i'm in, in to answer your question i'm in development with disney and warner brothers on other ideas right now and other shows and we'll see where things go in this remote hybrid editing do you use frame io or or what other system mm -hmm. do you use to look at the cuts so avid mainly um avid and then frame io for for cuts and notes i just want to mention i I started taking notes, as I say, about, you know, in episode three and some of the things that I wrote down that I wanted to talk about, which, you know, I don't we don't have enough time, but I wrote down, you know, Clint, Clint Eastwood, Stanley Kubrick, Superman, villains, wizards, Goonies, Color of Purple, Spielberg, Pee Wee Herman and Tim Burton, Batman, Columbia, I mean, Columbia on the lot, them leaving the lot, Goober, Peters. Goodfellas, Scorsese, and the list just keeps going. Steve Ross, I mean, I learned a lot about Steve Ross from you, and, and I didn't realize they had their own museum there, which is great. Um, I didn't know that Warner's was did put out the, you know, that was behind the first DVDs that were released. Um, it, the list just keeps going and going. I thought Clooney was great. Um, Chris Nolan, wonderful interview. Ellen, all the TV stuff was very revealing and just fabulous. Chuck Lorre was great. Uh, and like I said, I think you could easily make this a 10-hour series, and that would be my vote because I enjoyed it very much, and I wanted to say thank you for, for being a guest on West Dock. It really was an honor and a pleasure. Uh, well, it's an honor and a pleasure to talk to you, Chuck. I've been following you for a while and uh, a long time. And you're a big force in this documentary world. So thank you for all your great work. Thank you.